I'm Theodore, I'm lead rendering engineer here at Crytek. Welcome to this section of the curriculum. It's mostly about the rendering and to uh, start off, uh, I would like to give you basically an idea of what we understand in terms of rendering in, at Crytek. So for us, rendering is basically the entire process of going through the scene, finding what objects are visible, what objects need to be rendered, sending them to the GPU and then generating the final pixels. So it's a pretty long process. And uh, there's quite a bit of code involved, which you'll probably get in contact with. I did some rough numbers with Linux tools, and we have roughly between 400 and 450,000 lines of code right, related to rendering. And then there's roughly 60,000 lines of shader code. <laughs> so yeah, quite a chunk there. We currently support four graphics APIs. That is DirectX 11, 12, Vulkan, and the GNM API on the PlayStation 4. On top of that, we also have support for all the VR devices, uh, like the Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest, coming soon, and the HTC Vive. So my goal for this presentation will be to basically give you a rough overview and to provide you with the tools so you can dig into the code yourself. All right? This is mostly for coders. The core idea here is really that you get to know where to find the code that you kind of understand the general philosophy behind the code, that you understand the data flow, and that you get an overview of our rendering pipelines. And that should enable you then in the future to basically jump in and do the work you need to do yourself, hopefully. So, related code modules. We have the rendering code mostly in two modules, that is the 3D engine and the render DLL. The 3D engine code can be found in code, CryEngine, Cry3D engine. And the rendering code can be fo found in code CryEngine render DLL. We directly build those into DLLs and load them at runtime. So the 3D engine will be the 3D engine DLL. And the render DLL, we actually build four, actually five versions of this for each platform. So we have a CryRender D3D11 DLL, then we have CryRender D3D12 DLL, and so on. Functionality wise, the modules cover different areas. So the 3D engine is mostly in charge of processing objects, determining visibility of objects, updating objects, whereas the renderer is actually the one that interfaces with the graphics APIs. You can see that also here in terms of what kind of data structures, what kind of objects these implement. So for example, the entire scene data structure or oak tree is in the 3D engine, also the terrain system and the material manager. On the renderer, we have more stuff like the shader manager, GPU resources, and actual rendering algorithms. Now, these modules, as I kind of hinted at, have a very split functionality in a sense. So the 3D engine is mostly in charge of preparing a frame, whereas the renderer is in charge of submitting the frame to the GPU. And there is a, an exchange of work here, obviously. Once, when the 3D engine is done with the frame preparation, it has to send it to the renderer. Tasks that typically happen in the 3D engine would be the scene graph traversal, where we basically, for each view that we need to put on the screen, we go through the spatial data structure, the oak tree, we perform visibility and occlusion culling, that means we need to figure out which objects are actually visible in that view, and we also check for some views if the objects are occluded by other objects, and then we also have streaming updates, and so on. On the renderer side, we then convert this data that we got from the 3D engine into actual graphics API commands. For example, uploading new MIPS to a texture or issuing draw calls. In order to be performant, we do the work of these two modules in a pipeline fashion. That means while the 3D engine is preparing the frame, we are actually rendering on the render thread the previous frame. You can see here, I added the thread designations here. So the 3D engine works mostly on the main thread. The renderer works mostly on the render thread. And there is an overlap here. So the 3D engine prepares a frame while the renderer at the same time is rendering a frame. After both have done their work, we have a, a sync between the threads to avoid any problems for the next frames, basically to avoid the workloads to diverge too far. That means that when the 3D engine is done, preparing a frame, it'll actually wait until the render thread is done rendering the previous frame and vice versa. So this process basically goes on from frame to frame. Prepare frame on the 3D engine side, render previous frame on the render side, thread sync. Prepare frame, uh, render frame, thread sync, and so on. 
This is a typical pipelining approach and it unfortunately also brings with it its own complexity. For one, we cannot allow direct communication between those two threads. If the 3D engine main thread would prepare data and directly send it to the render and the render would directly read it, it would actually be in the wrong frame because they're working on distinct frames. So what we have introduced in the engine is a command buffer and all communication needs to go through that. So the 3D engine will add commands into that buffer and the render thread on the frame sync between the two frames, we give that buffer to the renderer and then the renderer can process those commands. We don't have an established communication path for the reverse direction at the moment. So if the renderer needs to tell something to the 3D engine, there is no established way of doing that. And if you think about it, it's actually a sort of an ill-posed problem because you're kind of sending data from the past into the future. So <laughs> <you're> <laughs> if you look at the data flow, you would be starting like in the render thread, say you start in frame N, you would, um, sorry, that's actually a mistake here. I apologize. This should be frame n minus two. <laughs> right, let's do the next one. That one is correct. Um, so if the, if the render thread would be sending a command or exchanging data from n minus one, frame n minus one, it would arrive in this frame here, which is n plus one. So there's a two frame difference, right? So that's the thing we generally don't do. So for commands, we have this command buffer approach for actual data like objects and stuff we need to have something more performant because we have potentially a million objects. We can't send a million commands. That's just too slow. So instead, we have what we call a render view. That is a class which is in the beginning of the frame allocated in the 3D engine. And then all the algorithms in the 3D engine will have access to it and they can fill it with data. When the 3D engine is done preparing the frame, the render view is passed as a whole to the renderer and the renderer can then read contents. And when it's done with it, it returns it to a pool for reuse. There is also a legacy strategy based on multi-buffering. Um, you will still find this in some classes in the renderer. This would typically be global state being duplicated, so having two or more copies of it. And then the main thread would be writing to one copy and the render thread would be reading one copy. There are some helper structs like the field thread ID, global variable, the process thread ID, which you could use to index that data. If you really want to know about it, just look for this M frame render stats struct in the renderer, but it's not advised to use this because it simply doesn't scale. And in the future, we'll actually remove all this multi-buffering stuff as well. So now we know kind of how to interact, how the, the threading model works, how the 3D engine interacts with the renderer. So let's dig a bit deeper into the 3D engine and look at the actual classes. I picked out the most important ones, the ones that you will likely come into contact with. So for a start, we have the CMAT info class, which represents material data. Basically, in there you have everything you need to render material. So that would be a set of textures, a shader, a shader technique, and a number of shader constants, and so on. Simple material description. Then uh, next to that, you have the render mesh. This is basically the representation of a mesh. It, is a list, it has a list of geometry streams for vertices and indices, and it contains a list of draw chunks is what we call them. Each chunk represents one draw call. So it's basically a little structure that says, if you want to draw this section of the mesh, you need to use this material, you need to use this start vertex, you need to use this index count. Building on top of those two, we have a higher level object, which is the stat object. It basically owns a render mesh and it owns a material and it extends the functionality of those two by having LODs as well and sub objects. LODs use lower resolution, lower poly count models for the distance and sub objects that is generally used in the engine for breakable stuff. If you want to break an object into parts, you would allocate sub-objects inside the, the start object and each one would have its own transform matrix that can be animated. Then we have the render node. iRender node is our render node interface. It is the base class of all renderable objects. Very common objects in CryEngine are the br C brush, the C vegetation, C terrain node, 
And then we have character node, particle emitter, and like 10 and more nodes. But these are the most common ones. These are the actual objects that are embedded in the, in the scene graph, in the object, in the oc tree. So speaking about the oc tree, we, uh, the oc tree nodes are represented by the cOc tree node class. Each node represents, as the name suggests, a single node in our oc tree. It has a list of pointers to child nodes, so it has eight child node pointers, and it owns a list of render nodes that are embedded in this oc tree node. Good detail to know, each object can only be present in one oc tree node ever. So we don't have a data structure where the data lives only in leaf nodes, but we also have it in intermediate nodes. And we have this guarantee that you can have only one, op like each object can only be in one node. This allows some optimizations in the engine later. And then the render view, as I explained before, this is our main container for passing data between the 3D engine and the renderer. So it's filled by the 3D engine and it's read by the renderer. I made a little diagram of how the brush class actually connects with its data members. Uh, you will, a brush is basically a, a, simple, a single object in the world, which is usually not animated, so it's just a static object. It has a pointer to material and a pointer to a stat object. The material itself is kind of recursively defined in its manner. Um, it has material information and then it has also a list of submaterials. And these are again CMAT infos. The start object has a render mesh and it has a number of lots. So there's a define, currently five. Uh, each start object can have five lots. And each lot is then again a start object. So again, it's sort of a recursive definition. And then we have to the pointer to the material. Going deeper into the render mesh, the render mesh itself has an index stream and a number of vertex streams. So this MVB stream is actually an array. And then the chunks are the individual sections of the mesh that would represent one draw call, as I explained before. And here on the bottom left, you can actually see the chunk described in a bit more detail. It has something like first vertex ID, first index ID, and a material ID. The material ID is basically an index into this list of submaterials in a material. So this way, basically, if you know the render mesh, if you know the material, then you can pretty much draw the object on the screen. You have all the information needed for drawing. OK, so let's look at the rough execution flow of the 3D engine. It basically all starts with the render world function, which is called by C system. And then, so basically, there is a lot of actions that happen every frame. I only picked out the most prominent ones, the longest ones. So from left to right, we have the particle manager update. It basically updates all the particle emitters. And then it will start update jobs for all the particles themselves. In many scenes, we have hundreds of thousands of particles. They all need to be simulated and updated. So this, this is done in jobs started here. Then we have the render scene function, which is uh, basically the larger scope for processing a view and generating all the data for a view. It starts off with preparing the shadow views. Typically, in our game scenes, we have five shadow cascades. Each one would be a different view on the scene. So this preparation here would prepare five or more uh, different cameras for performing shadow rendering. Then we have the terrain system update. In the terrain system, we basically figure out which terrain sectors are currently visible, what is the screen coverage of these, what textures are needed, do we need to stream anything in for these, do we need to update some meshes for the terrain, and so on. And then we have the actual scene graph traversal. And this is the part which is more or less the most complicated one and also the one you will likely see most. This is where we actually take all the views of a scene that we have and try to figure out which objects are visible by that view and which objects and produce the rendering data for those objects. It's split into two parts. We have the indoor octree traversal. We have a visibility area system 
You can basically draw shapes and then all the objects inside these shapes are represented with their own oak tree. Meaning that we can cull an entire tree if we're not inside this area. So it's kind of a portal system. Then we have the outdoor oak tree, which is in uh, outdoor games what you use mostly for what you use basically. I'll go deeper into that on the next few slides. This is a special case for rendering objects that can't be jobified. And then we have our merge vegetation system. This is a system that allows us to render massive amounts of grass and trees. And in the end of the render world, we basically have updated all the objects. We have um, updated all the algorithms. Now we can go through the list of objects and determine what, is, what LODs do we need for them, what meshes, what texture LODs do we need, and so on. That's part of the streaming manager. So it'll figure out, it'll schedule updates for the streaming systems, basically. In order for you to get an idea of, or a feeling of how things interact in the engine, I've prepared a frame capture of our woodland level in what we call the boot profiler. So here is a functional overview over fr five frames. Uh, on the left, you see the render thread, the main thread, and then a bunch of job system workers. So if you look on the left, here you have the render thread, the main thread, and I think on this machine I had something like six, no, eight, seven job system worker threads running. And then we have physics and audio and network, yeah. So it's actually using quite a bit of the cores on the system I captured this from. If you press control and then use the mouse wheel, you can zoom into the view. And then let's try to focus on one of these loop render thread profile tags here. So if you click this, it'll hide everything that's outside the scope of this profile label. And now you can actually see basically all the work that is done in the time frame of this loop render thread. So this loop render thread took like 20 milliseconds. You see all the, the work that's done on all the threads during that time. Let's look at the main thread, the 3D engine. We already saw the C system render and the 3D engine render world. And then we saw what I explained before, basically. Back in the slides, so here we have the render world and then render scene and then particle manager and so on, right? So if you hover over the individual blocks, you can see here, see particle manager update. And here you have prepare shadows and so on. And then terrain, outdoor oak tree. And then we have this large render non-job objects thing. And then merge meshes. And in the end, we basically streaming, update streaming, and that's it. In the meantime, while all this processing is being done on the main thread, on the render thread, we are actually doing rendering. So we, take, we have the data of the previous frame. We start with updating some stuff in our pipeline and preparing some data to render. And then we actually execute our graphics pipeline, which starts off with the gbuffer rendering, and then shadow rendering, shadow map rendering. Next, we wait for draw chops to be done on threads. And then we do our deferred effects, like screen space reflections. We do light volumes, deferred lighting and then forward, opaque objects, fog, uh, and so on. So it's a complex pipeline. We'll get into that a bit later. So you can see the work distribution is fairly evenly. We have this section here. I don't know if you can see the mouse. This section here where actually the main thread is waiting for the render thread. So in this capture here, we are render thread bound, basically. Uh, but you can see nicely the parallelism of the two threads. If we scroll up down a bit to the job threads, you will see here there is a lot of octree jobs. So for example, there is this C octree node render content, which will then recurse into render common objects, cull mask, uh, culling thread, test AABB, and so on. So the 3D engine actually keeps the, the job threads pretty busy over this time span. You see, all these are render octree node render content, that's something else, but all these are render content jobs. And same here and down here actually as well. Oh, look here, I caught a, a drawing job from the render thread. But you can see there's fairly good utilization ac actually ac across all the, the threads here. I hope this illustrates how the execution of the main thread roughly works in the 3D engine and how we distribute work across jobs and how the render thread in parallel works to that on rendering.
I will go back to the slides and actually dig a bit deeper into how the oak tree traversal actually works. As you saw on the main thread, we basically figure out which are the views that need to be rendered. And then we start traversing the scene graph, the oak tree. For each node that the main thread traversal algorithm hits, it'll create a check occlusion job. This goes in the job queue, and then some job thread will eventually pick this up. So we have a bunch of check occlusion jobs being scheduled by the main thread traversal. When these jobs are processed by the job threads, they will test if the octree node is actually visible by the camera frustum and against the occlusion system. If the node is visible, it will issue another job. This job will again go into the job queue. For simplicity, I put it here on the same thread. And this is the render content job. This is where the actual heavy lifting starts in the 3D engine. This rendered content job always processes one octree node, and then it loops over all the different objects that it, this node contains. First, it goes over the vegetations. Next, it goes over the, it calls C vegetation render. So that's the render interface function. And then it goes over the, the brushes list and calls brush render. And the rest of the objects are all grouped together into a shared list. That's the common object list, where it calls the virtual I render node render, which then in turn will be automatically dispatched to the correct implementation of the render node interface. For objects which support multi-threaded processing, for example, brushes, we, can, we actually, inside this render content job, immediately execute the processing function. For objects that have dependencies, some special objects like roads and stuff. They depend on other objects and we cannot guarantee thread safety. So these we cannot process immediately, we have to push them into another queue. This is what we call the, uh, the cal output queue. And this queue is basically then later processed by the render non-job objects function that we saw before. So again, the check occlusion job issues a render content job. The render content job will process all the, the render nodes that this oc this oc tree node contains and that can be multi-threaded. Those will be done in place. And the ones that are not possible to do in place, they will be pushed into queue. When oc tree traversal is finished, the main thread starts processing all these deferred non-threadable objects. So it'll iterate through the queue pick out each object and process it on the main thread. And we saw this in the capture here, actually. This is a pretty massive chunk of this capture. If you look at render scene, it takes roughly 10 milliseconds. Eight milliseconds of that is doing non-threaded stuff, which is somewhat unfortunate. <laughs> so now that we arrived at the render function for each object, I would like to give some detail about how the rendering of the object actually works internally. At the, by looking at the ZBrush class render. So we start at ZBrush render, and this calls into C start object render internal, which in then goes through a hierarchy of other function calls. Important here, for example, is it will select which LOD to render. And in case we are in the middle between two LODs, we actually issue two uh, renders from that. We render both and we have some blending on the GPU between them. But eventually we end up in the C render mesh render function. And this function will then loop over all the chunks and call C render view add render object. So this will slowly fill the render view with data for the draw calls here. This is a pretty expensive process. If you imagine Every single frame for each object, we need to go through all the draw calls and add those to the render view. That's a lot of operations repeated every frame. And in the majority of cases, nothing changes. So in the majority of cases, the draw calls that need to be done for an object, they're just the same as in the previous frame. So we have an optimization, which is called permanent render objects, where we build a shortcut. The idea is, if you have performed this C render mesh render once, and you have generated all the little blocks here, they're called S rend items in the CryEngine. If you have generated all the S rend items for a render mesh, you don't need to do that again the next frame. You can just store them persistently. And that's what is uh, done in this permanent render object. So we go through the, the render once, 
we store the render items in a permanent list. And the next time we hit the CBrush render, we figure out, oh, we've done this before. It's much simpler now. I can just add the permanent render object and be done with it. No need to recurse through the call stack hierarchy that we had before. This speeds up the engine massively, actually. In case we don't have this, so in the first frame, or in case the object does not support permanent render objects, we still have to go through the old pipeline and perform all the iterations through uh, start object render and so on and so on. But we're pretty much done with the 3D engine now. I'm just giving you some um, useful CVARs that are very helpful when you work with the 3D engine. So EB boxes will show you the octree node and the object boxes. So it'll draw on screen the, the, the bounding boxes of all objects. The debug draw has something like 20 different mo debug modes. The most common ones are LODs. So you can color code the LODs in the engine. You can, that way you can visualize LOD transitions. You can also display per object draw calls. So how many objects do you have in which pass for each object and so on. Uh, if you use the question mark operator, you will actually get help on these. Then we have the check occlusion CVAR. This one will turn off occlusion culling and visibility culling if you set it to zero. Then we have a special mode for debugging the coverage buffer. That is our occlusion culling system. That's basically a pretty involved system. In a nutshell, it reads back the depth buffer from the GPU and then tests for the next frame, tests all objects bounding boxes against that buffer to see if they're occluded by other objects. You can use this CVAR to visualize the coverage buffer on screen. Then we have the SysMax FPS to fix the FPS. It does only work when you turn off vSync, otherwise it's, uh, the frame rate is vSync locked. But this is useful, for example, when you have to debug timing related problems. So for example, if you have some flickering on screen, first thing I usually do is set suicide max FPS to two and see if the flickering is periodic. And then you know pretty much immediately, oh, there is like a one frame dependency issue. You can turn on and off shadows with eShadows. I think it has something like four different values where you can turn off shadows of sun, shadows of local lights. Then you have the CA draw CHR that turns off uh, drawing of skin geometry. You have E entities, no drawing of entities. E brushes, no rendering of brushes. E vegetation, no rendering of vegetation. E sun turns off the sun or on. And then you can turn on and off water volumes and the ocean. Okay, so much about the 3D engine. Let's go to the render. And this is where, at least to me, it becomes interesting. <laughs> I will present to you in this section the API layers we have in the renderer. These are basically the interface functions and the classes which allow you to interface with the graphics APIs. And then in the second part, we will have a look at how we render stuff. So we ha will have a look at our graphics pipeline and see what algorithms the CryEngine implements. So, but first let's look at the rendering API layers. We have a, a pretty strict hierarchical system when it comes to rendering API. On the bottom, we have the native layer. That's basically an implementation layer. It contains all the code specific for a certain graphics API. For example, on DirectX 11, we have the DirectX 11 implementations of the low-level API. On DirectX 12, we have the DirectX 12 implementations and so on. Ideally, this layer has been written once and will not ever be touched again because we don't expect anything to change in here and hopefully there are no major bugs anymore. So this is something you, I really hope, never have to come in contact with. On the next higher level, we have the low-level API. This is our high-performance rendering API. So it's not like OpenGL. <laughs> this layer is more in the spirit of Wilkin and DX12. On OpenGL and DirectX 11, you have basically this immediate mode rendering API where you issue commands, where you say, bind this texture, do this draw, uh, set this vertex buffer, set this rendering state. This is not how, how Wilkin and DX12 work. Wilkin and DX12 have these compound objects where you, you can say set this shader, but instead you say, set this object which, which contains the shader, it contains all the depth states, it contains the rasterizer state, the output merger states, and the vertex formats and so on. Set this object as a whole. So they grouped a lot of 
simple functions into bigger objects. And this is reflected in this API as well. It's fairly small. We only have seven classes here. But those are rather big compound objects. For example, the C device resource set is not a single resource, but a set of resources. You allocate this class, you allocate an object, and then you can put any sort of resource into it. Textures, uh, buffers, constant buffers, and so on. So it's a collection of resources. We then have what we call a resource layout that also is a concept that comes from DX12. This is basically a description for describing all the resources that a specific draw call needs. So if you do a draw on the screen, you need to create a resource layout for that draw, and that, uh, that layout needs to contain everything that you will ever read in the shader, every texture, every buffer, every constant buffer. In DX12, this would be called the root signature. Then we have a device stream set. This is a set of vertex and index streams. Then we have a device command list. This is the interface where you actually issue commands. So this is the interface that, that finally has the draw command. It has a command for binding resource sets. It has a command for binding a resource layout, and so on. And then we have the pipeline states. And that's the object I referred to previously. That is the object that contains the shader and all the GPU states together. And we have two versions of it. We have the graphics PSO, graphics pipeline state object, and the compute pipeline state object. One is used for general graphics rendering, and the other one is used for compute. And then we have the last one. It's a singleton object. It's our object factory. So any object you want to create, it needs to go through the object factory. If you want a resource set, you need to go to the object factory and say, give me a resource set. This layer is used in the next layer in the hierarchy. So the high-level API basically builds on top of the low-level API. It uses all the classes from the low-level API. But that's pretty much it. We have very, very few algorithms in the entire CryEngine that use this low-level API, except the next higher-level API. You are free to use it. So if you really, really need high performance code and speed, you basically can use it. But uh, I have to warn you, it's fairly tricky. There's a lot of dependencies. There's a lot of boilerplate code. So instead, what most of the CryEngine rendering algorithms use is the high-level API. And this is where things are actually much more programmer friendly. So we only have four major classes that do drawing and rendering. There would be the scene render pass. It's kind of a high performance pass that draws basically hundreds, thousands of objects sent by the 3D engine. It's a specialized thing. Then we have a full screen pass, which issues a full screen triangle or full screen quad. Then we have a primitive pass, which renders multiple primitives, multiple objects into a render target. And then we have the compute render pass, which issues a dispatch. On the right side, we have the resources colored differently. We have a C texture class which represents a texture object. Then we have a C constant buffer class, which represents a constant buffer. We have a C shader, a C GPU buffer, and uh, some specialized buffer manager handle. And then we have a sampler state. OK, so the important classes, you kind of saw them already on the previous slides. The, for the resources, the texture, GPU buffer, constant buffer, C shader. Then in the higher level rendering API, we have the full screen pass, primitive pass, scene render pass, compute render pass. And then we have another hierarchy layer above those, which we call graphics pipeline, or in the hierarchy below that, graphics pipeline stages. And then on the lower level, we have the resource sets, render passes. So a render pass basically represents all the output textures that some draw call has. So it's a collection of render targets and depth targets. Then the device stream set, as I said, a collection of vertex streams, the pipeline states, then the layout and the command list. And for exchanging data with the 3D engine, we have the srend item. If you remember, the 3D engine puts all the stuff that needs to be rendered in form of srend items into the render view, and then the render view itself. So the low-level API. Again, you will likely not get too close into contact with this one, but it's good to know some details. So on the resource side, we have these four classes. Well, it's three abstracted classes and a bunch of 
non-abstracted ones. So the C device texture, that's basically a texture allocated by the graphics API. So it contains memory for the texture and uh, in a certain format and with a certain usage pattern. Then you have the C device buffer. It represents a buffer on the GPU. So a texture is a formatted piece of memory. So you, you have format operations on it. For example, you can do bilinear filtering on it. You can do typed reads. So, so you can load RGBA, you can do sample compare and so on. And the buffer is just like in C++, a general memory buffer. The GPU doesn't necessarily care too much about the layout of these objects. Instead, it's, and it on, on the GPU, it also doesn't go through the general filtering hardware. It, it's just a memory load, basically, like in C++. So textures are typically used when you need sampling operations, interpolation operations, when you want to do basically all sorts of data remapping. If you just want to read data, if you just want to have structures on the GPU, you, you would usually use a buffer. All right, so C device buffer represents a buffer on the GPU. Then we have sampler states. So these configure the texture sampling operations, for example, bilinear sampler state, or you can have uh, wrap, clamp, and so on. And then we have the shader. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten around to abstract this in a, in a device class. So instead, we use the DirectX 11 interfaces still. So you, in some places, you'll find ID 3D 11 pixel shader, vertex shader, even in high-level code. Um, that's something we will hopefully fix soon. In order to make this work on all platforms, we simply redefine those classes to the platform-specific ones. On the high-level API, we have the C texture, and that's, that's the object you will likely see quite often. What's important to know about this object is that it can be empty. So it holds a pointer to the device texture, to the actual GPU texture, but this pointer can be empty. That means you're free to allocate texture objects, empty texture objects, and then on demand only allocate the memory for it. So that makes the high-level code a bit easier to work with. We have various state tracking inside this class. So for example, each texture knows about streaming. It knows about which MIP maps it has streamed in already, which ones it would like to have, and so on. And then it has a name and size properties and so on. So in a debugger, you can ins inspect actually quite a bit of state here. There is an invalidation callback mechanism as well. This is tied to the property that the texture can be empty. You can, as client code, register a listener to the texture. And whenever the texture decides to drop MIPS or to completely delete the GPU memory for the texture, you will get a callback. And that is needed in the more complex rendering objects like the full screen pass, where, for example, it has an, a mechanism to realize if someone externally changed one of the textures it needs to read or write to. The creation of the C texture object happens via get or create functions on the device object factory. So you have various specializations. You have get or create 2D texture, get or create texture object, get or create render target, and so on. There's step stencil target uh, as well. The get or create here means that the renderer or the device object factory will do its best to reuse memory. So if you create a texture and then delete it again, the device object factory will typically keep it around for, I don't know, a couple of frames, 30, 40 frames. And if you happen in the next frame to ask for a texture object with the same size and format, it'll just recycle it. This increases the runtime memory overhead, but on the other hand, it's quite a speed up and allows high-level code to actually allocate and delete stuff on the fly every frame. High-level code doesn't need to care about persistence. Then we have the buffers. So there's the CGPU buffer class. This is a general purpose class uh, buffer object. It is quite easy to use, I would say. It's almost like a, a C++ vector, where actually you can put arbitrary data into it. You have no restrictions about formats and so on, um, and usage patterns as well. The tricky thing with all the GPU resources is the interaction with the GPU. When you allocate a resource and write into it and then pass it to the GPU, the resource is, what we say is, it's in flight. So it's 
the GPU will at some point in the future read from it. If you, on the render thread, decide to write to it, you, are in a, you can produce easily a race condition where you're writing data and the GPU is reading at the same time. And that'll, well, in the best case, have a little bit uh, visual defects like flickering, some stuff rendered, rendered wrong. In the worst case, this will actually crash the GPU. So in order to prevent this, we have a multi-buffering mechanism built into this buffer. So whenever you update the contents of such a buffer, the underlying system will check, is the memory actually used by the GPU? And if yes, it will allocate a new block of memory, a new C device buffer, and use that instead for you, pass that back to you. So you can fill another one, a new one. But all this happens behind the scenes, so you don't need to care about it. It might be good to know about it, but you usually don't have to get in touch with these systems. It also has an invalidation callback me mechanism for this case. So when a buffer reallocation happens, so a new buffer is allocated, there's callbacks being fired. And then we have the device buffer manager. This is a special thing just for vertex and index streams. This class is basically there for performance reasons. So it's sort of a high level manager for vertex and index streams, and it exposes various usage patterns of these streams and implements optimized strategies for then managing the memory of these buffers. The usage strategies we have here is BU, so buffer usage, immutable, static, dynamic, and transient. And as the names kind of suggest, if you allocate a buffer with BU immutable, you're telling the system, I'm allocating this buffer once, I will fill it once, and then it'll stay static, it'll never change. BU static is a little bit less strict, so you're telling the system, I'm allocating a buffer, I will fill it, and then it'll take a long time before I fill it again. Dynamic is a bit more frequent updates. So you're saying, I'm updating this buffer almost every second or third frame, quite often. And then we have BU transient, which is even more update frequency, even higher update frequency. That's a specific buffer type, usage type, for fire and forget data, for data that you prepare once, send to the GPU, and then you don't care about it. And, and the GPU also doesn't care about it anymore. So you, you fill it, you send it to the GPU, and in the next frame you fill a new buffer and fill it. All these strategies are implemented in specific ways inside the buffer manager. For example, for BU transient, this is basically one large buffer, one very large buffer, which is whenever you say, please fill it with contents, it just gives you a new chunk, you fill it, and at the end of the frame, it will just throw it away. So give it to the GPU and throw it away. In the next frame, allocate a new massive buffer. It's a bit of a special use case, but it's used when you want to, for example, send the camera vertices in a vertex stream to the GPU. That changes every frame. So you fill it once, GPU consumes it once, and then it's garbage. Then we have dynamic is less efficient. So this is also a sub-allocation mechanism. But in here, we actually track the usage. So if you allocate a buffer with dynamic usage and fill it, the buffer manager knows, OK, this is used. And then when you decide to delete the buffer, throw it away, it will actually be re uh, marked as not used and then be reused. The cool feature about this buffer manager, apart from its speed, is the, fragmentation, the defragmentation support. So it has automatic support for defragmenting all the buffers it knows about. Uh, I can give an example. In Hunt, we have something between two and 400 megabytes of buffers. And without defragmentation, due to us constantly allocating and deleting buffers, we end up going out of memory pretty soon because we get a lot of fragmentation. With this feature enabled, we actually shuffle unused buffers around, compact them, and uh, it's actually a lot more stable. <laughs> you have to believe me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> then we have C constant buffer. Uh, if you're familiar with OpenGL, that would be the, the equivalent of a uniform buffer for shader constants. This is uh, also a class where we predict the usage will be very high frequency writes and of very often fire and forget writes. So we have a specialized manager for this one as well on most platforms. 
We basically have the same sub-allocation scheme as in the regular buffer manager, but specifically for constant buffers on DX11.1 and upwards, and Vulkan and GNM. The reason why we don't have this on DX11.0 is that this requires pooling of buffers and we need to bind these buffers then with offset. So you need to be able to tell the graphics API by bind this constant buffer, but bind only some specific offset as a start. And you don't have this in DX11. There we let the driver do this work, which is also often quite fast, but we don't have direct control over it, so it can produce side effects that we have no control over. And this is important to know, this is the only resource which you can actually bind directly yourself. All the other resources, when, when you want to bind them to the, to the shaders and the GPU, you need to put them into a resource set. This is the only one that can be bound directly. Okay, then the sampler state handle. This, as I said, represents texture sampling configuration. We have inside the device object factory a global database of sampler states. And whenever you ask for a sampler state, you will likely get one that has already been created before. So uh, there's a lot of sharing happening, typically. In order to make the interface a bit more convenient, we have pre-allocated the most common ones and put them into an enum. So you can directly use e default sampler states point clamp, for example, that gives you a point clamp sampler. Or we have wrap trilinear, wrap trilinear clamp and so on. If you need to have a, a custom state that is not predefined, you can always go through get or create. So much about resources. So this is our class for implementing a full screen pass. If you look at it, it's basically an object which has some pretty self-explanatory functions, I hope, to set up state and then to basically render. Let's go quickly through the functions. So I'll start here. The way this is built is that you always, for each full screen pass, you allocate a new full screen pass object. So it's heavily object based. I stole this code from the Bloom stage, which does a horizontal and a vertical blur pass. So the Bloom stage would have two, two full screen objects, one for the horizontal pass and one for the vertical pass. So each draw is one object. Each object can be set up with a bunch of state setter functions. So for example, the set primitive flags sets some flags. In this case, this uh, flags reflect shader constants, PS, it tells the system, me as a programmer, I want to set shader constants by name. So I directly want to call the set constant function, function with a name and some values to set it in the shader, as simple as it gets. The PS annotation here means I only want to do this for the pixel shader. I don't want to do this for the vertex shader. There are other flags to allow this on different shader stages as well. The next one set primitive type. It tells the, it sets up inside the pass what kind of geometry you want to draw. And we have a list of predefined geometries. I believe the default one is actually the procedural triangle. So this call is obsolete. I believe, I'm not entirely sure. This is actually the most, the fastest ones typically on newer GPUs. It just on the GPU generates a full screen triangle. As a little bit of side information, if you're interested, there is many ways to draw full screen effects. You can draw, for example, two quads, two triangles to uh, cover the screen. You can draw, draw a full screen quad if the API supports it, or you can do this full screen triangle thing. And it has been proven that on the most recent GPUs, the full screen triangle thing is fastest. And the reason for that is for once, if you do two triangles, you have always the, the line in the middle between the triangles and the quads there will be rasterized twice. And then the cache behavior is best for a triangle because the rasterizer will produce the fragments in the most optimal fashion. Anyway, side information. This should be the default, I believe, and this should be the one that should be used usually if you want speed. Then we set the shader that we want to use to render. The first argument is the actual shader. The second one is the technique name. So we use Gosh Bloom technique here. This is a predefined name. Then we set the output targets. So we put this texture as a render target in slot zero. We say, no, we don't want a depth test. Then we set textures where we want to read from. So this would set texture 
HDR target scaled on texture slot 0. And then we also need to bind a sampler if you want to read from that texture. And then we call begin constant update. This instructs the path that now we begin to set shader constants. Then we do that. We set the constant HDR params 0 name. And then we call execute. And execute will then actually perform the draw call. So far, I think, I hope it's a pretty easy to use interface. What is very important about all these passes is they have persistent state. So when you set up the pass once, the state is retained for future frames. So in theory, you could call all this setup code once, and then just every frame just call execute, 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 without having to reset up all this code again. This, in practice, obviously, you often have to change some stuff, like new constants, for example, like here, the constants might change. So some of the data is dynamic, but that's why we have this dirty mechanism. This is the, the if in the beginning. So this checks if the pass is fully set up and if nothing has changed inside the pass. The first time we go through this code, this check will fail because the primitive has not been set up yet. So we'll do all the setup code. In the next frame, though, we'll just skip all these function calls because the pass hasn't changed. And that way, in subsequent frames, we actually render the entire thing with just three calls instead of 12 or so, or 10. So this is a pretty decent optimization that you can do, but you don't have to. What means dirtying? The is dirty. So this would also catch cases where you as a user have edited the shader, where you rewrote the shader code, then the system would detect, oh, this shader has been changed. It would reload the code, recompile it, and then the the full screen pass would become dirty and you would set it up again. Same goes if someone reallocates the input texture or changes the size of it. Next we have the, in the, also in the complexity hierarchy, we have the next complex object. This is a primitive render pass. It's similar to the full screen render pass except that it renders multiple draw calls into the same target. So each draw call is represented by a C render primitive object which you can set up just as the full screen pass before. You have functions to set all the resources, the, the textures, the shader, the geometry, the render state. And then you can pass this to the pass, to the primitive render pass, and the pass will then render it. What's important here is the pass does not take ownership of the primitive. So you as a client are responsible for buffering those primitives across frames, for keeping them alive until the pass is done rendering. Here is an example from the clip volume stage. It, you can already see there's a bit more code now. So as a first step, we need to prepare the pass. We need to tell the pass wh what are the output targets, what is the viewport, the size, and then we tell it to, uh, that we are actually starting to add primitives. And then we fetch a primitive from our list of pre-allocated primitives. See, this is a reference here, so we're just shortcutting the name here. We set it up, again, with similar functions as on the full screen pass. We set the technique, we set the render state, a bit more complex this time. We, need, we want greater equal depth, depth test, and we want to enable stencil. And then we set custom vertex stream. So we pass a handle to a custom stream that holds the vertex data with a custom format and a custom stream stride. We also set a custom index stream with a custom stride here. We set the culling mode, so we want to have front side culling. We set the stencil state. This is a bit more a more complex state. So the stencil state itself is a 32-bit value which encodes all the possible variations that you have in stencil. So the operation for stencil pass, the operation for stencil fail, the operation for depth fail. And then we set the actual draw information. So we tell the primitive, OK, this is actually a triangle list. And we have start index, start vertex, st start at the beginning of the buffer with at zero. And we render this many indices. And then we have to compile the primitive. This is important. The compilation step takes all the setup that you have done inside the primitive and converts it into runtime data. So for example, it will create a resource set containing all the resources you bound. It will create a pipeline state for, all the, for the shader and all the, the GPU state that you set up, and so on. Only after you have compiled the primitive, you can render it inside a pass. So, and that is already the next step. We have compiled the primitive. We can now add it to the pass. 
and when we call pass execute, the primitive will be rendered to the screen. Done. So this is the next complex version of a full screen pass. It allows you to render arbitrary ge geometry and arbitrary number of geometries into a single target. Then we have the equivalent of a full screen pass, but in compute. Just to give you a very broad idea, on the GPUs we typically have specialized hardware to deal with uh, vertex data and triangle data and primitive data. So there is hardware blocks that take vertices, that take the description of the vertices, say it's a triangle or a triangle list, and then rasterize these on the screen, produce shader invocation for each pixel that intersects these triangles. That's quite a bit of fixed function on the, the GPU, but the units that execute the shaders, they're actually kind of general purpose. So it's, it's like uh, the execution units on the GPU are similar to CPUs, except they're, they're extremely wide CIMD operations. So on AMD, you have 64 data threads that are running concurrently. On NVIDIA, it's 32 or 64. And since these units are kind of general purpose, the graphics API, starting with DX11, have evolved to a place where you can actually run code on these units without using all the fixed function hardware. So you can write a shader, and you can run this on this general purpose computing hardware on the GPU in this massively parallel environment. And that's what compute is for. Compute is really, really great if you have massively parallel tasks. For example, in an image, color each image pixel. There's millions of pixels that we want to touch, and they all do the same thing. That's perfect for compute. So some stuff in the CryEngine, and also, well, basically in, in all the high-performance game engines and rendering engines, is better realized as compute than as graphics pipeline shaders. And that's why we have this compute render pass thing. And it works very similar to a full screen pass. You have functions to set the technique, you have functions to set the resources, set textures, set samplers. You have a function to set an output unordered access view, output UEV. So that's something that came also with compute. In a normal rendering graphics pipeline setting, you're always tied to the pixel that the riser, rasterizer produced. So you cannot really output anywhere else. In compute, you can write to any location in a buffer or in a texture that you want. So that's what's called an unordered access view. You have, you have basically random scattering writes, if you want. And that's exposed via this output UAV function. And you just pass a, a general buffer in here. And then again, we have a big in constant update. And then we call set constant. Uh, twice to update shader constants. And then we set the dispatch size. This is another compute peculiarity. So this configures how the threads on the GPU, this massive parallel system, groups the work into units. So for example, on AMD GPUs, like in the consoles, you have 12 compute units. Each unit can do 64 threads in one cycle. So each group of 64 threads is called a wavefront. It has a buffer of 10 different wavefronts. So you have concurrent execution on this GPU of 12 times 10 times 64 threads every single cycle. So it's pretty ridiculous. And in order to optimally utilize these massive amounts of threads that you can run concurrently, you need to group them properly. And that's what you do with the dispatch size, in a nutshell. <laughs> it's a lot more detailed if you really want, need to get into it but it's a pretty fascinating topic. There is a special call in here, this prepare resources for use. This is something that you just have to do before execute at the moment. This will go away in future versions of the CryEngine. It has to do with when you write to resources and switch resources from reading to writing, you need to sometimes perform transitions. The GPU needs to do operations. And this is happening inside this prepare call. So these were the three easy objects, the three objects that are very simple to use. We're now getting to the more complex stuff. And the reason why this is complex is because this is where we actually do the heavy lifting. So if the 3D engine decides to send a million objects for rendering, this is what handles this in a performant way. All right, we call it a scene render pass. 
it has multi-threading capabilities, meaning that it can automatically split the work and perform it on multiple threads. And it's built for doing high-speed rendering of literally hundreds, thousands to millions of objects. In order to get to this sort of speed, we need some quite specific constraints on the rendering data. So, one of these constraints is reusability of the same resource layout for all draws. So whenever you have a lot of objects that you want to push into a scene pass, they all need to share the same resource layout. The same description of how the resources are bound to the shaders. The way this is currently hard-coded is that we have one resource set. Remember, a resource set is a group of resources. We have one resource set which is set at per pass frequency. We have one resource set that is set at, as, at per material frequency. We have one resource set that is set as per draw frequency and one inline constant buffer per draw. These are the only four bindings that you can have and they are at these three frequencies. When rendering a full screen pass, these resources are bound exactly as I just described. So when you start the pass, we set the per pass resource set, we set it once and we keep it set. We do not overwrite it. Whenever a new material needs to be rendered, we set this material resource set. It is bound until we have a material switch. So you can already see one good operation that we should do in the engine and that we actually do is sort all the draw calls by material. So we group them together. That means less switches per material. And then we have the per draw things. So for every single draw call, we, have, we can have one special resource set. And this is where all the draw call specific data would go into. This is currently used, for example, for skinning, where we pu would put dual quaternion buffers for the skinning transforms into it. Or for tessellation, where we have another buffer per draw that would contain the adjacency information for each triangle. And then we have the per draw inline buffer. This is shader constants for each draw. This typically is stuff like the object matrix and so on. As I said, you can only draw things that follow this setup of resources, but <laughs> you can draw a lot of them actually. So it's restrictive but performant. Examples there are, uh, would be, for example, the opaque pass in the CNG buffer stage. So something that I haven't explained yet, I told you basically that the 3D engine uh, sends to the render a render view, which is populated with s rend items. And each s rend items holds, item holds all the information that's needed to issue a draw call. I omitted a step here. The s rend item holds compressed information to do a draw call, but the draw call typically also needs resources and GPU state. So we kind of have to have a process that converge converts each s rend item into a representation that can be accepted by a scene render pass. And that's where the compiled render objects comes into play. Before we, we give the render view to the renderer, we call a function called compile modified render object. And this function will then loop over all s rend items and create a compiled render object and fill a compiled render object for this rend item. Inside the compiled render object, we store all the data that we need for rendering. So for example, we have a pipeline state or more pipeline, a bunch of pipeline states actually. We have a, a resource set for the extra resources. We have a constant buffer and so on. So this is basically the, the last step in the hierarchy of data transfer. So the 3D engine goes over the scene graph. It visibility and occlusion calls all the objects. The ones, the objects that survive these tests, will loop over their, will go into their render mesh. They will loop over the rendered chunks. Each chunk will then be converted into a rend item that goes into the render view. And before we render, the rend items will be converted into compiled render objects. And only then we can actually interface with the graphics API. So much about the interface. Now. We have a lot of rendering algorithm, a lot of rendering code in the engine, and we need some sort of a hierarchy structure to organize this. And this slide roughly, des roughly describes how we do it. So on the bottom of our hierarchy, we typically have, we have the rendering algorithms, which are normally implemented by the high-level rendering API. So for example, we have seen before the Bloom algorithm, 
it would have two full screen passes, one for a horizontal blur, one for a vertical blur. The algorithm would then be put into a pipeline stage. So for example, for Bloom, we have a Bloom stage, which contains all these two passes and nothing more. But there are cases where a pipeline stage might contain more than one algorithm. And then all the pipeline stages together that we need for rendering a frame form a graphics pipeline. In 563, we have four graphics pipelines currently. So we have the standard graphics pipeline. This consists of all the stages and all the components and algorithms that we need to do the full high quality rendering that CryEngine does. So it is a deferred rendering pipeline with all the post effects that CryEngine offers and all the, the deferred effects and so on. Quick excursion. <laughs> Traditionally, when graphics chips and APIs were built initially, everything was rendered forward. So that means you issue a draw call to the GPU, the draw call will run a shader, and that will then just be put into a buffer. And the buffer will in the end be presented. That's forward rendering. That implies that inside this shader, you need to read the material attributes for the draw call, and you need to loop over all the lights in the scene and calculate the material light interaction. So if you look at this in a computational complexity sense, it's an order of number of draws times number of lights algorithm. Deferred rendering splits this process into two sub-processes. The first one renders only the geometry and outputs the geometry information into a buffer. Once we're done, we start the second process, which then loops over all the lights and then applies all the lights to the generated buffer and produces the image this way. Computationally, it has complexity order of number of objects plus number of lights. In big scenes with a lot of lights, this makes a massive difference. You have number of lights times number of objects versus number of lights plus number of objects. In small scenes, it's pretty much it doesn't matter. So CryEngine supports both modes. But since we, in the standard graphics pipeline, we typically deal with highly complex and visually very complete scenes, we actually prefer the deferred rendering algorithms. When we are rendering on mobile, for example, we have way less lights and way less draw calls. And there we actually tend to prefer the forward pipeline. But back to the pipelines that you have currently. So the standard pipeline is a deferred one with uh, a lot of effects and post effects and so on. So full feature set of the, of the CryEngine. Then we have a minimal graphics pipeline. This is a forward-only pipeline with a very limited set of effects, which is used, for example, in Sandbox when you have preview viewports of objects, or it's used for ocean reflections and so on. We have a specialized character tool pipeline. It's basically a pipeline specifically built for the character preview viewport. Don't ask why we had to do that. <laughs> And then we have a mobile graphics pipeline, which is currently work in progress. It's already in parts in 563, which is specialized for mobile devices. Let's look at the standard graphics pipeline. These are all the stages we have in there. It's not ordered by importance, but alphabetically by name. If you count, it's 36 stages. So it's a fairly complex thing. And again, I won't be able to cover everything, but I'll try to give you at least the most important parts of it. Conceptually, we start, when we render a frame, we start on the left. We take all the draw calls stored in the render view, and then we generate a gbuffer out of it. That means we bind three gbuffer targets, I'll go into the details a bit later, and we draw all these draws for the gbuffer, all the opaque draws, and output the, the material and surface attributes into specific buffers. Once this is done, we generate shadow maps. So for each of the shadow views, we generate a depth map with all the objects in it. Then we build deferred effects, all the screen space effects. For example, like screen space directional occlusion, SSDO, screen space reflection, SSR, the shadow mask, and so on. So these are all effects that in the deferred context that you can run in screen space and that depend on the gbuffer and maybe the shadow maps and the deferred data. Then we go to the tile shading stage. This stage is the shading part of the deferred rendering. So this is the stage where we take all the geometry attributes and loop over all the lights and light each pixel in the image. Unfortunately, I can't make this image a lot bigger, but 
uh, you can already see the colors look a bit weird. This is because the output of this stage is in linear space and in high dynamic range space. So you can easily have colors with values of 5,000, 6,000 in there for the sun. And you can have colors with values of very close to the minus 5. So it's a very massive range of intensities that we store in there. We typically store this in 16-bit floating point precision. When this image is generated, we basically have processed all the opaque geometry that can be done with a G-buffer and we have fully lit it. So this is kind of a finished image in HDR space for the opaque G-buffer compatible stuff. On top of that, we add fog, so distance fog, and forward rendering. So particles, for example, transparent stuff, glass, water. After that, we're pretty much done with the geometry pipeline. At this point, we have rendered everything the scene has in terms of geometry, and now we go into post-processing. The most important part here, this is again a very complex pipeline, but the most important parts here are first, we need to take this HDR image and convert it into something that the monitors, normal monitors can actually understand. That is done in the tone mapping stage. And then we have color grading, which is artist configurable to allow setting a, a, a color mood, basically. You can change all the colors in the image to, it's like you do in the film processing engines often. And then as a last stage, we have our anti-aliasing, post processing anti-aliasing and then tada we're done final frame so this process takes yeah it depends i mean depending on what game you make you have a budget of uh, if you run at 30 fps 33 milliseconds if you're at 16 then it's 6 6t fps you're 16 milliseconds and so on if you're in vr you have usually a budget of 12 milliseconds or 11 and you do all these processes right so it needs to be quite efficient. I would now give you a bit more details on these stages because these are the most important ones, but we'll later look at the capture of a frame and then we can dig a bit deeper if you're interested and see what exactly how this stuff is run. So let's start with the G-buffer. As I said, this renders compiled render objects from the render view into targets that store material data. We have three different layout modes for this buffer. The first one is our standard lighting model where in the RGB con components of this buffer, we store the normal in 8 bits. In order to get more precision out of it, before storing it, we compress them into a best fit encoding. In the W component of this buffer, or in the alpha component of this uh, render target, we store the lighting model that's, that occupies 2 bits in there. And for this, for this mode, we basically store a 0. Then we have the surface albedo. We have the surface reflection. It's uh, chroma encoded, YCB, YCR. And then we have the surface smoothness. For lighting model one, we have support for transmittance and subsurface scattering. So we, we store almost the same data as before, except we have in the alpha channel of the second target, the surface scattering profile ID. So the engine defines various subsurface scattering profiles, for example, for skin, for marble, and there is a third one I'm not sure about right now. But in here we would store the index to use, the subsurface scattering index. And then we replace the reflectance with transmittance. It's again encoded. And then we have the third G-buffer layout, which is used for parallax occlusion mapping with self-shadowing. Again, the same components as before, normal albedo, but Lighting model is 2 now, and we have here in the blue channel of the third buffer, we have parallax occlusion mapping self-shadowing contributions. Okay, shadow map stage. This is where we perform shadow rendering based on the render view again. So the render view gives us the shadow frustums, and this stage converts it into depth maps. For the sun, we have cascaded shadow maps. That means we have normally in the default configuration five shadow maps for the view frustum, with bigger and bigger sizes the further away they are from the viewer. These can be split into dynamic cascades and static and cached ones. The dynamic ones are re-rendered every frame, whereas the cached ones are updated only when requested. That's an optimization, basically. For local lights, point lights, area lights, omni lights, we have what we call a shadow pool. So that is a gigantic render target, depth target, and each light or each side of, a, of an omni light will get a section out of that target, a chunk. The reason why we do this 
is that based on how far the light is away from the viewer, we can scale up and down the resolution to not waste space and processing time. We also have a controlled caching scheme in there. So in the light, you can uh, configure the update rate, how often these shadow maps are updated for each light. Next is our actual lighting stage. This is what the tile shading stage, what we call. So it loops over all the pixels on the screen and it evaluates the light surface interaction for this pixel. It does this by reading first the attributes from the G buffer and then looping over all the lights that affect this pixel and, and evaluating the BRDF for that light based on these surface attributes and then accumulating all the light inputs, combining it with the previously calculated deferred effects and outputting this. The end result, as I showed you before, is a fully lit version of all content that we've rendered up to now. This is implemented as compute for performance reasons and it's run in 8x8 screen tiles. Next we have the forward scene. So remember in our pipeline we are now basically here. We have covered the first half here. We are now moving into the last section of geometry rendering and then into post. So as said before, this is the last section of geometry rendering. So this renders forward. Basically all the stuff that cannot go into the G-buffer. Yeah. This is split into multiple passes. We have forward opaque, which if you think about it is actually a curious thing. Why wouldn't we put opaque stuff into the G-buffer? But the reason for that is the G-buffer layout is quite restrictive and we have some draw calls which just need more material attributes. For example, hair has a very specific shading model with very specific inputs. So we just can't fit this stuff into the G-buffer. That's why we render it in this pass after G-buffer. The good thing about this is since it's opaque, since these shaders render opaque stuff, we still have access to deferred effects like the shadow mask or SSDO. So we can still have feature support of these effects on those shaders without actually much cost. After this, we have transparent rendering. So we render here stuff like particles or glass, uh, fog and so on. These shaders render transparent stuff so we cannot build deferred data for them. If they need to receive shadows, they need to do all the shadow map sampling themselves, which is fairly expensive. So these effects, if you want full lighting quality on them, full uh, effect quality, it can get uh, expensive very, very quickly. The transparent stuff is further subdivided into stuff before water and stuff after water. This is to get correct rendering order. So we first do before water, then we render the water surface on top, and then we render after water, such that stuff blends approximately correctly. And that's it with geometry rendering. Next we have tone mapping stage. This is the stage where we actually convert the HDR data into LDR data for display on regular monitors. We don't have yet a pipeline for HDR monitors that is also in the process of being built. Um, by default, we use filmic tone mapping with Hables curve. It's a well-known remapping in the industry. The controllable parameters of this curve are exposed in Sandbox in the Environment Editor. So you can, for example, control the steepness of the curve and the scales and so on. And then we have the color grading stage. This is done after tone mapping. Each color can be remapped by an artist-driven color chart. It's actually a, a color volume. This is basically a simple lookup table. In the engine, we support two modes of this lookup table. We can have static, a static lookup table, which is set up in environment editor, and it'll just be used like it's set up. And then we have a dynamic way of setting up the color charts. That's why a flow graph, where you can place a node, set a path for the texture, and set a transition times, and this, there the, the colors will actually be blended. The color charts will be blended and animated. And then we have anti-aliasing as the last step in the pipeline. We have four different anti-aliasing algorithms that we currently support. One is SMAA, 1x. <laughs> SMAA stands for Subpixel Morphological Anti-Aliasing. This works by looking at the image and trying to detect edges. It looks for known patterns like L shapes or diagonal line shapes, straight line shapes. And if the algorithm detects one of those shapes, it'll basically reconstruct the edge by filling in pixels. The base version does just that. Then we have the 1TX version, which on top of that adds a temporal reprojection component. This means we look up the, the color of this pixel in the previous frame and merge it with the current pixel. 
And in order to have temporal coherency, we have a clamp on, on the merge. It's basically done per component. The 2x version does a, a more sophisticated clamp. Uh, it's actually pretty deep technical details, to be honest. <laughs> um, it works slightly better. And then we have purely temporal reprojection for anti-aliasing. It doesn't do the edge detection and edge reconstruction, but it, pu it purely blends the data with data from previous frames. Pretty cool feature we have is this anti-aliasing mode debug CVAR. It gives you this, as in the image, it gives you this zoomed in part of the frame. And if you see the little dot here, it actually, this shows you the sampling pattern. If we do temporal reprojection, what we typically do is we, for every frame, we jitter the image slightly to get slightly different rasterization and more data for the, for the temporal averages. So I would encourage you to try this out. It's a pretty cool feature. This pretty much concludes the section about the graphics pipeline and the graphics interfaces. Let me give you some useful CVARs again. The R driver CVAR lets you select the graphics API. You can choose DirectX 11, Vulkan, or DX12 here. Our width and our height uh, configure the width and height of the rendered image. Our show render target is a very helpful tool. It allows you to visualize any render target in the system on the screen by name. Our display info lets you change the display info text on the top right. Our debug gbuffer shows you the gbuffer targets uh, on the screen. Shadows cascades debugs give, gives you color-coded shadow cascades. Our profiler presents, shows the frame profiler on the screen. Our wireframe gives you wireframe drawing. Anti-aliasing mode lets you set the anti-aliasing algorithm. Our deferred shading lights turns off local lights in deferred shading, in tile shading. Uh, this is very useful for checking for performance and actually for bug fixing as well, for checking if lights are causing flickering. Deferging env probes disable environment probes. Deferging tile debug show you the light overlap on for each screen pixel. It gives you a color coded map of how many lights are needed to be evaluated for each screen pixel. And then we have RUC pass, which would uh, let you select the depth prepass uh, to use a depth prepass or not. Um, a depth prepass means that we would do all the draw costs that go into the G-buffer, but only render out depth to speed up early depth rejection and to only shade each, generate a geometry attribute once per pixel. So the games we shipped so far, Climb and Robinson, use the deferred renderer. And we are currently working on a Climb port for Oculus Quest, and there we're using forward renderer. So it really depends on, on the game setting and the performance of the GPU as well? Mm, no. It's, the split is inside the transparent section. It would require changes in the pipeline, but that should be super easy to do. Yeah. It would have some drawbacks. You would not be able to see stuff below the water surface. Yes, of course. Our transparent shaders can use the data structures that the tile shading algorithm uses as well which is per screen tile, a list of lights that intersect that tile. And the water shader actually has this implemented. So I think in the material edit editor even you have an option, I think it's called PBR, where the shader loops over all the lights that intersect this pixel and then calculate the contribution. It uses the data structures. For tile rendering, we need a light list for each tile. And that list can also be used in other passes. It's not specific for the tiled algorithm. Yeah. This stuff is super expensive, though. So if you look at a very wavy ocean with tons of overlapping wave geometries, you will be in trouble, likely. Let's move on to the shader system. So uh, as I said before, we have roughly 60,000 lines of shader code written in HLSL. They're spread across 63 different shaders. And we have some sort of a, a split into include files and actual code files like we have in C++. So the actual code, the actual modules are stored in the CFX files and shared shader code, shared functions, shared techniques are stored in the C5 files. Conceptually, we can split shaders into two categories. We have scene object shaders and we have pipeline utility shaders. Um, 
the, note that this is not like hard coded. We have shaders that have both functionalities. But this is from a conceptual point of view, this is, I think, easier to understand. Scene object shaders are the ones that are available for artists in Sandbox, basically. So you have them in a drop down in Sandbox, you can apply them to arbitrary objects in the scene. They provide techniques for supported scene passes. So as you heard, objects that come from the 3D engine always go into scene passes. So these shaders need to have code for specifically for these scene passes. These are the four commonly used techniques. There is technique C prepass, which is a technique that would run a depth only pass. Then we have technique C, which will be run if you render the object in the gbuffer. Then we have technique shadow gen, which is run when the object is rendered into shadow map. And then we have technique type general, which is for general forward rendering. If a shader does not implement a technique, it will simply not be rendered. The object will still, that binds the shader will simply not be rendered in the corresponding scene pass. And what's important, since they are bound to scene passes, the in shader inputs need to conform with the scene pass conventions, with the per pass resources, the per material resources, and so on. Examples of these are the Illum shader, vegetation shader, human skin shader, hair, glass, and so on. And then we have pipeline utility shaders. That's something that graphics programmers would typically come in contact with when they modify the post pipeline, when they modify internal stuff, like, for example, functionality to downscale images and so on. They're not exposed to the UI, and they have no restrictions when it comes to data inputs and outputs. As long as the layout in the shader matches the one in C++ code, you're fine. Typical examples of these shaders are deferred shading, uh, CFX, post effects, CFX, scale from CFX, and so on. Our shader system makes heavy, heavy use of a permutation system. This means we have a special syntax, preprocessor-like, with if, def, and if, which you can plug into your shaders and enable selectively, enable parts of them. For example, here, this is a section from the Elum shader where we have this if blend layer section. The parser will automatically make two versions of this shader. It will generate one version where blend layer is disabled. It just strips out all the code that is inside this if. And then it'll generate the second version of this shader where blend layer is enabled, and it'll just include all the code for this permutation. So this shader here generates two versions, two permutations. This is heavily used in two major groups. So first we have material permutation flags. These are the permutations that are available to artists, again, in Sandbox. They're put into the shader ext file, for example, ilum.ext, which you find together with the shaders, two folders higher in the hierarchy. And these files have a list of these property tags. Each one defines one of those permutation flags. For example, this property uh, is named detail mapping. This will produce in the material editor a checkbox detail mapping, you see here. In the legacy material editor, it will be here. So you, as an artist, can enable this permutation by clicking the checkbox in Sandbox. Material permutation flags occupy one bit inside a 64-bit integer. That means we can have at most 64 permutations per shader. So this is what this mask is about. It specifies which bit is used. And you need to be a bit careful to not have multiple permutation flags with the, sh with the same mask, because the shader system would not be able to distinguish them. We have UI name, description. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Then we have the runtime permutation flags. These are for programmers. These are global, typically, and they're shared across all shaders. Again, they're inside an ext file, but this time it's a global file, which is called runtime ext. And this has all the possible permutations. We have only 64 of them, one bit per permutation. And what's important to know here, shaders can only see these flags if they are mentioned specifically in the pre-cache, in this pre-cache tag as down here. So if you happen to, to add a runtime flag to a shader, make sure that you go to the runtime ext file and enable this pre-cache line, copy this pre-cache line there. Otherwise, you will not ever see it. The shaders we use most com com commonly in CryEngine is Elum, that's by far the most commonly used. 
I would guess it represents 90%. It can represent 90% of all hard surfaces that we see on a daily basis. It uses a standard microfacet model with kind of industry standard shading terms. It's the one that's used most often. Then vegetation is pretty common as well. It has a specialized translucency model and it has specialized custom vertex animation pattern for grass bending, so the grass moves in the wind and so on. Then we have hair, which has a specialized BRDF for hair rendering. We have glass, which has specialized glass shading methods and so on. But these are the most common ones. So when in doubt, always use Elum. <laughs> Shaders are compiled by the standard third-party tools. For each API, we have a different tool. For example, for DirectX, we use FXC on DX11 and 12. For Vulkan, we use DXC, and for PS4, we have yet another compiler. This compiles the shader source code into the driver-specific representation, which will then be yet again compiled into a GPU-specific variation inside the driver. What's important to know is that we only have direct compilation on Windows and on Windows PC, basically. All other platforms require the remote shader compiler. The remote shader compiler is a separate tool. It is distributed with the CryEngine. You can run it from tools remote shader compiler cry as compile server. It is a network tool, so it listens on a port and your uh, local engine can connect to that and basically have the tool compile the shader for you and the tool will then send back to you the compiled shader blob, shader executable. If you are to ship a game with CryEngine, you want to ship also the shaders with the game because each time a client plays a game and there is a missing shader, the compilation will cause a stall. It will interrupt the user experience and that's actually quite annoying. So we have a mechanism to pre-compile shaders. First of all, the most commonly used shaders are already shipped with the CryEngine. They are in this shaders cache pack and shaders bin pack and so on. And if you have additional ones, you can generate those as well with an offline process. And this works as follows. Each time the remote shader compiler gets asked for a shader compilation, it stores the request to a file. And at the end of the day, you can gather all the requests that you have received that day and put them into an offline process and generate the shader cache from that. The offline generation has one nice property. We have knowledge over all the shaders that are needed. So we can do a bit of filtering and optimization across different shaders. We also have a caching mechanism for locally compiled shaders. So if you run the engine on your machine and you happen to uh, run into a shader that has not been compiled, once you get the compiled shader either from the remote compiler or from your local compiler, the compiled shader blob will be stored in the user folder. So next time you run the engine, it'll be there pre-compiled. And I think that's it so far. We can fire up the sandbox and do a bit of shader editing. To get shader editing to run, we need to do a few steps. Navigate to C program files, Crytek, CryEngine, Launcher, CryEngine 5.6, and then open up system config. And in here, you plug a line, R shaders editing. So this puts all shaders into editing mode, where you can modify the shader text and the engine will recompile this. Save this. Go back to the folder where the engine resides. Go to engine and unpack the shaders pack file. Yeah. This should give you a folder with all the text files for the shaders in there. Then to be safe, please delete everything that has shaders in the name, delete it. And then we should be set. Now we can go back to the Crytek folder, go to the game SDK 5.6 folder, and then run the editor. Okay, then let's make a new level. Just the default settings for the height map and the terrain works. Let's just add some object. So we can go create brush and add a simple brush into the scene. Yeah, let's 
So, let's inspect this object. So you can bring up the material editor, tools material editor, and then it's a bit difficult on one screen, put this here. Here in the hamburger menu you go to file, pick material from scene, and you can just pick say the roof material. So in my case this is as expected Elum shader. Let's have some fun with that. So let's go back to the extracted shaders. Go into hardware scripts, cryfx, elum, cfx. And you can see already there's quite a bit of code here. In here you see this technique channel, script equals statement, right? And it says technique z, c pass. As you saw before in the slides, this means for the g buffer, this object uses a technique called c pass. If you search, you won't find it in this file. The C pass is shared between almost all shaders. So I will tell you because I know, but you can also do a global search on all the shader files. You can find it in the common C pass CFI file. So please open the common C pass CFI file. And in here, you will find technique C pass. If you take a closer look at this technique, for the pixel shader, it uses common C pass PS. Now that's the thing that we need to edit. You can just search it on this file and you'll find the code for outputting the gbuffer attributes for this shader. If you scroll down here, there is all sorts of code to calculate normals, to calculate albedo, smoothness, reflectance, and so on and so forth. Until at the very bottom, we hit a piece of code where we output all these calculated attributes to the gbuffer. Let's overwrite albedo. So we write attrips.albedo equals 100. Okay, let's save the file, go back to the editor. So you can immediately see the result of changing the albedo here, right? So let's output something more fun than just red. So we're a bit limited right now, we only have access to st values in the system. So you can pick this one, it's in.wpos.w. That is basically the distance to the camera in meters. If you switch back to the editor, so for some reason I have to trigger manual shader reloads. So this will output the distance of the camera to the pixel. If I fly around, I think you can actually see how closer to the camera it gets dark. See? Well, let's do something more interesting. Okay, so three lines and it's an interesting effect. And this is purely based on stuff available already in the shader. If you're binding more textures, and more stuff, you can do a lot more stuff. What we did right now is we edited a scene shader. So we modified the gbuffer output of a scene shader. We overwrote the albedo with a blue color, right? Next example would be changing a post-processing shader. So if this is where we do the post-processing, the color chart, and the tone mapping. So if you plug these few lines in here, we get a nice circle <laughs> post-processing effect. And this is all done procedurally, right? Just a bunch of lines of shader code. I think what is important for every programmer that needs to work with the renderer, you can hopefully use the slides and the notes in the slides as a reference for when you actually do the work. Okay, that's it. Thanks, guys.